السلام على رسول الله وآله وصحبه ومن والاه. And after Abdul Hakim's Arabic lecture yesterday, I'm sure you know exactly what that means. Um, slight um, revision of what I was saying yesterday. I misled you by suggesting that I was going to continue the track that I'd mapped out on this hadith of Gabriel, Islam, Iman, and Ihsan. In fact, consulting, as I very occasionally do, the, the, the menu for today's activities, I see that I'm actually slated to talk about scriptural links between Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. So in order not to um, upset the um, smooth unfolding of the, the curriculum here, I shall indeed speak on that. So I'll be talking about Islam as part of a wider family of faiths not about Islam as it exists within itself, which is what I was holding forth on yesterday, but Islam as it has interacted with others. And perhaps the best point to start with is the not sufficiently appreciated fact that while pundits of popular culture and often quite educated people as well tend to have this image of Islam as the quintessential other, that civilization, that package of religious beliefs and values which is the most alien to Western people and the least comprehensible. Whereas in fact, Islam is the closest of all religions to Christianity. It's closer even than is Judaism. You could say that the world's religions divide um, very um, crudely and, um, and broadly into three categories, these three that you'll sometimes see comparative religionists trot out. Um, animism, of course, <coughs> represents the um, beliefs of uh, primordial tribal communities, the idea that the divine exists or inheres in rocks, trees, and so forth in the form of spirits. Um, so animism or shamanism would be this first category of the world's religions. Secondly, the monistic religions, which are those which don't believe in a personal god, um, but in an impersonal force, a being which is constantly engendering the world and calling it and the individual souls therein back towards itself. Um, so that second category includes faiths like Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, and perhaps one or two others. Thirdly, there are the theisms, i.e. those that believe in a personal God. They believe that the world was created in time and that it will come to an end. The creator is, in some sense, a personal deity, approachable through prayer and through worship. And the creator reveals the divine nature through sending scriptures mediated by prophetic figures. Now, Islam is part and parcel of this third family, this theistic family of religions. They are sometimes referred to as the Abrahamic religions, since they all recognize the prophet Abraham as their common uh, patriarch and identify very strongly with his rejection of idolatry and his quest for the one true God. So we have here a shallow cultural archetype which is wrong in quite an interesting way. Islam is not the other. In fact, it's a Western religion. Obviously, it originated in the Middle East, but then so did Judaism and Christianity. Um, in my final lecture next week, I'll be attempting some thoughts about the relationship between Islam and the West, particularly in the 20th century. Today, however, I intend to look more closely at what Islam shares and perhaps what it doesn't share with its two great predecessors. Now, the simplest way of doing this is by comparing the Islamic account of salvation history with that of Christianity and Judaism. And the most striking initial point is that Islam's view of history is actually a lot closer to that of Judaism than to that of uh, traditionally held by most Christians. Judaism sees history as an evolving saga of human distraction um, rectified by periodic divine prophetic interventions, sometimes angry, sometimes rather wistful. Islam more or less shares this perspective. It only disagrees with Judaism in a few respects, which I'll now attempt to list. Firstly, Islam very emphatically prefers the style of Jewish religion proclaimed by the great annunciatory prophets of the Old Testament, such as Isaiah and Jeremiah, with their thundering yet ultimately compassionate awareness of the subtlety of sin in the human soul. 
And it prefers this style of Jewishness to the complexities of rabbinical Judaism, as this was worked out in the Second Temple period, and essentially brought to its modern orthodox form um, with the codification of the Babylonian Talmud in the late first and early second centuries of, of the Common Era. Um, however, there is a distinction. Muslims regard the rabbinical form of Judaism simply as too difficult, an unnecessary compl uh, complication of the simple, yet nonetheless law-inspired prophetic ideas of the um, Old Testament prophet. And so we find that Islamic law, the Sharia, is in fact, while in some ways clearly a continuation and an affirmation of Jewish law, nonetheless simplifies it very much, ameliorates it. The most obvious case of this is, for instance, um, the laws on purity, a lot easier in, in Islam than in Judaism. If you look at um, Jacob Neusner's translation of the books on, on purity from, from the Talmud, you'll see there are several volumes just on how to keep yourself clean. In the books of Islamic law, it's um, at most a few pages, depending on, on the scale of the commentary. Similarly, there's an amelioration and a simplification of the dietary laws. Jewish dietary law is very difficult. Um, there's the obligation, for instance, to keep milk foods uh, apart from um, meat, etc. That prohibition has not been continued in Islam. There is the, the kosher regulation in that uh, animals have to be slaughtered in the, the kosher fashion, drained as much as is feasible of the blood. Nonetheless, generally speaking, Islamic dietary law is a good deal easier than Jewish law. So you'll find in schools, for instance, Muslim kids will have less difficulty at lunchtime than will Orthodox Jewish children. Similarly, in Islam, the Sabbath laws are more or less done away with. Islam doesn't actually recognize a day of rest in the traditional Jewish or Christian sense. There is the Friday prayer, and Friday in most Muslim countries is a, a public holiday. Nonetheless, people can work there, and there's no a complex web of prohibitions on what you can and can't do on, on that day. Second major point is that Islam has drastically modified Jewish patterns of fasting. The traditional Orthodox Jewish fast is 24 hours, the Yom Kippur fast being the most conspicuous example. Um, the Muslim fast, as I explained yesterday, and as perhaps you'll be trying tomorrow, extends from first light until sundown. Thirdly, the question of the covenant. Islam holds that God's covenant has been extended beyond the people of Israel to cover a truly multinational, universal religious family in which genetics, inheritance is irrelevant. So what the Quran refers to as the Ummah, an important term. You can omit the final H if you choose. This means the, the family of all Muslims, the community of Muslims. And it has no ethnic um, connotations whatsoever. And Islam's self-perception is that previous episodes of prophecy, whether in the Semitic tradition or in others which are not mentioned by the Quran, were specific to particular human groups. So we find a hadith saying, the Prophet saying, every prophet before me was sent only to his own people, but I was sent to all mankind. And another illustration of this is a famous hadith in which we learn that on the day of judgment, every prophet will intercede for his own community. Moses will intercede for the Jews, Jesus will intercede for believing Christians and so forth. But Muhammad will intercede not only for the sinners in his own community, but for sinners in other religious groups as well. Now this idea clearly sets Islam at a considerable distance from traditional Jewish ideas of a chosen people. In fact, Islam has theologically been unable to accept such an idea, at least in its orthodox Jewish formulation, because it seems to impugn the ethical nature of God. If one people is chosen, that seems to imply that other peoples are rejected or are seen as less deserving of the divine intervention, and that is um, not in keeping with the, the Quranic ideal. The fourth great difference between Islam and Judaism is, of course, and this is the most difficult one when it comes to dialogue, the acknowledgement of post-Old Testament prophecy. Orthodox Judaism does not accept that Jesus and Muhammad were authentic messengers of God. In fact, there are rites in Orthodox Judaism for the ritual cursing of both of these prophets. 
recently in the West Bank settlement of um, Kiryat Arba, for instance, in, in occupied Palestine, um, the rabbis held a ritual cursing of, of the Prophet Muhammad, which was reported in, in the British press. And this is there in the Babylonian Talmud, and the formulas for it are, are established. Similarly, the Babylonian Talmud, um, in a lengthy passage, lists the alleged sexual perversions of Jesus and says that his punishment in the next life will be to be immersed forever in boiling excrement. Um, interestingly, though, the halakha, the Jewish law, differentiates between Jesus and Muhammad. Jesus is, in fact, regarded as a worse offender. The Talmudic commentators universally state that Jesus was executed justly by a properly constituted rabbinical court for his blasphemy. Medieval Judaism also held that the doctrines of Trinity and the Incarnation were monstrous compromises with the Old Testament ideal of the one single God. Hear, O Israel, um, thy Lord, thy God is one. Hence, for instance, we find, again in the, the halakha, the Jewish legal literature, the great Maimonides, the greatest um, exponent of Jewish law in the medieval period, saying that if a Jew fears persecution by Muslims, he can pretend to be a Muslim to escape that persecution. That's permissible. But if he fears persecution by Christians, he cannot pretend to be a Christian because Christianity is a compromise with monotheism, whereas Islam uh, is not. Similarly, the uh, halakha discussion of kosher wine also illustrates this point. Um, the, the rabbis argue as to what one should do with a bottle of wine that one finds has been opened. And they conclude that if it has been handled by a Christian, it has to be poured away. If it's been handled by a Muslim, it can be sold, although it can't be consumed by Jews. And this is a consistent assumption that runs through medieval Jewish law, although obviously um, much of this has been, been reformed by contemporary Judaism, and this should not be regarded as some kind of judgment on, on, on Judaism as a religion, but it's there in the, the medieval texts. And I cite it to illustrate this distinction that Judaism traditionally made between Christianity and Islam. Um, now, this relatively positive attitude, or comparatively positive attitude towards Islam as compared to Christianity, um, probably also reflects the social conditions of, of the Jewish experience of life in the medieval period under followers of Islam and Christianity. Christianity, until living memory, included in its official doctrinal formulations the principle that the Jews were collectively responsible for the death of Christ. The Vatican only formally abandoned this position just 20 years ago. And the Gospel text, particularly the Gospel of John and also the letters of Paul, accuse the Jews collectively of murdering God himself, of deicide. Um, a German New Testament scholar called um, Gerd Ludemann has recently published a, an in-depth study of this, um, a book called The Unholy in Holy Scripture. And it confirms the general, although very shamefaced, realization that 2,000 years of quite hideous European anti-Semitism has roots in the New Testament itself. He quotes, for instance, just to take one example from Paul's first epistle to the Thessalonians, chapter 2, verses 14 to 16. For you, brothers, became imitators of the churches of God in Jesus Christ, which are in Judea. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out and displeased God and opposed all men. But God's wrath has come upon them at last. And Paul's attack here on the Jews for having killed God himself is here simply drawing on the anti-Semitism which is prominent particularly in Acts and in the Gospels themselves. Um, recently, a British bishop, um, Hugh Montefiore, of Birmingham, who's himself from a family of converts from Judaism, caused a, a controversy when he said that the Gospels are anti-Semitic documents and certain portions of them should not any longer be read in churches. Um, he cites, for instance, the passage in Mark's Gospel um, where we have the parable of the wicked husbandmen. The owner of a vineyard, in this case an allegory for God, sends his son to admonish his misbehaving tenants, but, according to Mark, those tenants said to one another, this is the heir, come let us kill him and the inheritance will be ours. And they took him and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read this scripture? 
The stone which the builders rejected is become the head of the corner. This is Mark 12, verses 7 to 10. And this allegory, composed perhaps some 30, 40 years after uh, Jesus' trial, is very clear. It is the Jews that have killed God's Son, and hence they will be utterly destroyed and their land given to Gentiles. And the stone that was rejected is quite a popular church sermon image for Jesus even today. So this central scriptural assumption that the Jews killed Christ determined Christianity's attitude to the Jews. For two millennia, they were mistreated. That's a very complex issue about <clears throat> that, you know, this position of, of, of official anti-Semitism was founded in the New Testament. And while I don't want to get into it now because I think it would inter in, you know, interrupt the flow of the mm -hmm. lecture, it's much more complex, I think, mm -hmm. than that. It's complex, but increasingly I think that the theological consensus has been moving in favor of the acknowledgement that traditional Christian anti-Semitism has justified itself with reference to the Gospels. Yes, and St. So, so Paul does not. justified itself with reference to the Gospels. Mm -hmm. uh, in John's Gospel consistently uses the expression what you die in Greek, and it's traditionally translated as the Jews. But there's increasingly uh, scholarly opinion that what you die away in Greek can also be translated as the Judean party, which represents the sect of leaders mm -hmm. who are Sadducean and temple oriented, and who in many ways <coughs> oppose Jesus as they opposed other Jewish leaders who were mounting popular quote, quote, revolutionary movements that were upsetting their stance, especially with Rome. So. Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to accept that. Um, I, merely because I'm not a New Testament person, I'm mouthing the opinions of most of my colleagues at the Department of Theology, where this issue is, is very um, deeply and sincerely discussed. We have, for instance, a, a complete paper in the department on um, Christian responses to the Holocaust, which goes into this question of the possible anti-Semitism in the New Testament. Um, I'm not sure that we have to come down on one side of the discussion or, or the other. What I'm trying to say is that traditionally the Jewish experience of Christianity was a pretty negative one, and which I accounts for... Christians too often times didn't in fact justify their, that's right, uh, yeah. their tendencies toward hostility to Jews precisely on these, these, these right. documents, but I think that a lot of times there were fundamental misreadings of these documents, but because of the anti-Semitic flavor of Christianity, they used these documents invalidly to support their anti-Semitic mm -hmm. practices. Sure. No, I'm not trying to say that these documents are uh, ineluctably anti-Semitic. I'm merely saying that the Christian tradition overwhelmingly down the centuries has read them as such. Exactly right. right. So I, I should perhaps um, rewrite this and make it a little bit more nuanced in future. Um, I cite all of this in order to explain why there has been such rabbinical mistrust of um, Christian people. For, for centuries, the Jews were mistreated on the basis of this reading of the New Testament. Islam, however, proceeded on a very different kind of founding narrative. The Quran records conflicts, sometimes quite sharp ones, between the early Muslims and individual Jews and Jewish tribes. And there is a Quranic polemic against Judaism. However, the distinction is that the Jews are not singled out as some kind of uniquely malevolent force in history. Similarly, the Quran does not accuse them of the crucifixion of Jesus or of deicide. For Muslim theology, the Jews have not killed God since God is not and never has been incarnate. So for most of Muslim history, we find that the Muslim world was in fact relatively benign and tolerant towards Jews. The Christian Byzantine Empire had actually prohibited Jews from living in Jerusalem. As soon as the Muslim armies captured Jerusalem, a proclamation was issued and Jews could return and live there in peace. So it's been estimated that as many as nine-tenths of medieval Jewry actually lived in the world of Islam. Blood libels and pogroms of a type um, normal in Europe were actually effectively unknown in the Muslim world. Jews could rise to senior administrative uh, positions. Maimonides himself, for instance, became the personal physician of, of the great Saladin. And as Samuel Goitein has said, compared to Christian Europe, the lands of Islam were a paradise for the Jewish people. Um, recently I came across an interesting illustration of this um, in my visit to Bosnia. There is a Bosnian Jewish community, sadly decimated during the Holocaust, but there's still a few thousand of them there. And their, their family language is actually Ladino, which is a kind of Spanish. 
Um, they're Sephardic Jews who, after the Reconquista of Muslim Spain in 1492, chose to emigrate to other Muslim countries rather than um, uh, live under the rule of the, the Catholic monarchs. And for 500 years, they've retained this very Spanish aspect of their culture. And in fact, when the Ottomans conquered Constantinople, they sent rabbis out to Germany and other parts of Europe, inviting Jews to come and settle in Constantinople to live there and to uh, um, support the, the economic and, and demographic growth that the Ottomans wished to see there. Now this is a very encouraging example of medieval tolerance and even symbiosis and I think when we contemplate the frankly quite dismal misunderstandings that exist between Jews and Muslims today, it's very important that we be aware of it and, and bear it in mind. Since 1948, this symbiosis and this even empathy has suffered immeasurably because of the creation of the State of Israel. From 1948, there has been a forced expulsion of the mainly Muslim Palestinian population from their homes and a continued Israeli population uh, policy of constructing Jewish settlements on occupied Arab land. And this, understandably, makes it very difficult for modern Muslims to look with the old equanimity on the Jewish people. Zionism has, in practice, tended to be resolutely hostile to um, the non-Jewish populations it conquers. For instance, a booklet published by the Central Region Command of the Israeli Army explains, quote, Under no circumstances should an Arab be trusted, even if he makes an impression of being civilized. In war, when our forces storm the enemy, they are allowed and even, enjoyed, even enjoined by the halakha, Jewish law, to kill even good civilians. That's not the view of some extremist, that's there in a document published by um, a, a unit of the Israeli army. And the current Oslo Agreement, which has actually accelerated Israeli settlement building and precipitated a rapid upturn in the death rate on both sides, has already made matters even worse. Um, so the situation in, in dialogue between Muslims and Jews is a very fraught one. In fact, there are very few contexts, at least in Britain, where there is serious dialogue taking place. Anyway, so much for the historical background. Um, the message is quite simple. Despite superficial complexities, recent hostility among Muslims is the result of political circumstances, not the result of any fundamental clash in doctrine. Jews and Muslims in their understanding of God and in their methods for achieving salvation actually more or less speak the same language. And historically the coexistence of Muslims and Jews is one of the most encouraging examples of religious toleration. What I want to do now is to look at the basis for this successful, although albeit sadly forgotten, coexistence, namely the scriptural overlap between the Hebrew Bible and the Quran. This obviously records and includes an important overlap between Islam and Christianity as well. Of the 26 or so prophets mentioned in the Quran, all but five appear in the Hebrew Bible as well. So that's a major overlap. The remainder are Arabian prophets. Um, for example, the prophet Hud, H-U-D, one of the Quranic prophets who was sent to the people of Ad, A-D, in what is now South Yemen. And in fact, the um, annual festival of the prophet Hud is one of the biggest annual events in, in South Yemen. His tomb is known, visited, part and parcel of, of the Islamic view of, of, of prophetic history. The people of Ad, the Quran explains, uh, rejected his message, persisted in their vice and idolatry, and so God destroyed them with a roaring wind. This is Surah 41, verse 15. There's no trace of this, or in fact of any non-Jewish prophet in the Bible. But in fact, this fact is not, not so significant because the tales of these Arab prophets that we find in the Quran and the divine response to them are not in fact categorically different to the, the stories that are told of the Hebrew prophets in, in the Bible. All that is unfamiliar simply is the idea that a prophet doesn't have to be a Jew. And this is of course cited in the Quran as a prop to Muhammad's claim to prophecy. He himself was also reproached by the Jewish communities he was in contact with for not being a Hebrew. Um, so these Arabian prophets appear in the Quran partly to support the prophet, prophet Muhammad's own claim. In the same light, I think we can appreciate that the that Muhammad's own self-understanding as a prophet really is very similar, perhaps even identical, to that of the biblical prophets. 
The criteria by which a man is regarded as a prophet in the Old Testament also apply fully to um, the prophet Muhammad. And this is, by the way, one of the most familiar complaints that Muslims make when they are in dialogue with Jews or Christians. What, on what basis, for instance, does one consider Jeremiah to be a true prophet of God but does not extend the same status to Muhammad? What did the one have that the other lacked? So the Muslim image of a prophet is not significantly different to the Christian or the Jewish one. But does this mean that the stories of the prophets that we find in the Quran are identical to um, the equivalent narratives in the Bible? Well, in some cases, we can say yes to that question. For instance, um, in due course, we'll have a lecture here on Surah 12 of the Quran, which is entirely dedicated to the prophet Joseph. And there are a few minor details which appear differently, but effectively, it's, it's a reiteration of the picture um, so beautifully portrayed in, in Genesis. There is one difference, however, which is a significant one. In Genesis, Genesis, it seems that Joseph is actually tempted by Potiphar's wife, whereas the Quran seems to insist that he was not. This is because the Quranic idea of prophecy insists that a prophet, to be deserving of uh, the mission with which God entrusts him, has to be ma'asum, that is, divinely secured from major sin. Ma'asur means inerrant, impeccable. So this is really the, the significant difference that one can locate um, between the Old Testament view of prophecy and the Quranic one, the only significant one. The Old Testament prophets can sin and repent, uh, that's part of their greatness. The Quranic prophets are infallible. Other examples, for instance, um, the story of Job, told very briefly in the Quran. This is Surah 4, um, verse 163, also Surah 38, verses 40 to 44. It doesn't suggest that his affliction was in any way merited because of what he'd done, but merely that it was a trial from God which he bore patiently. It has no further significance. Other cases include the notorious instance, uh, incident of David and Bathsheba. Um, I'll just read to you the biblical account. This is um, 2 Samuel uh, chapter 11, verses 2 to 4. And it came to pass upon an eventide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her. Now there was no way this story could form part of the Quranic idea of what a prophet is supposed to be. In the Quran's view, a prophet can't steal another man's wife. So we find this story simply censored out. It's not there in the Quran, not there in the Hadith, and forms no part of the Muslim image of David, who is regarded instead as a perfected human being. Other uh, incidents from the life of David also pop up in scattered passages of the Quran, um, which are familiar. Uh, for instance, David killed Goliath, became a king, he received both knowledge and wisdom from God and the ability to do justice. God gives him a scripture, the Zabur. Um, I'll write this up. Hence, he's one of the great prophets who actually receive written revelation. Um, whether this can actually be identified with the present day Psalms is something that the Muslim theologians haven't agreed on. Um, David has the ability to make the birds and the mountains his servants so that they unite in his praise. God also teaches him how to fashion chain mail out of iron. Um, in the Hadith and in subsequent Muslim legend, which um, often drew on Midrashic and other Jewish material to create a sort of luxuriant legendary material around the bare bones of the story sketched by the Quran, we find other ideas. We're told that David had this miraculous ability to sing the Psalms in a beautiful voice. Um, <clears throat> so that he was able, through singing them, to tame the passions not just of human beings, but also of animals and even inanimate objects. So that's a brief thumbnail sketch of Islam's take on the prophet David. Much more significant, however, for the Quran's purposes is its narrative of the great prophet Moses, known to Muslims as Musa. The Quran frames its narrative um, with a polemical point in view. 
namely to show the very close parallels between the ministry of Moses and that of Muhammad. It states explicitly, for instance, that the two shared the same doctrine. This is Surah 43, verse 11. Like Muhammad, Musa is accused of being a magician by the idolaters. Like him, also, he has been given a book. In Moses' case, this is the, the Torah, in which, as the Quran says, there is illumination and guidance. That's the Quran's description of, of, the, of the Pentateuch. The biography of Moses in the Quran more or less follows the Exodus account, although, as always, it's told only in summary. You have to remember that the Quran is not a history book. It's not the heroic narrative of a people, um, like the Hebrew Bible. It invokes earlier prophets, but only in a summary way in order to make a particular point. Um, it's not interested in merely supplying historical facts. So in the Quran, we find narratives about the infant Moses and how he was cast into the river Nile and miraculously a member of Pharaoh's family finds him and raises him. As a youth, he accidentally kills an Egyptian and has to flee. And in the desert of Midian, we find him watering the flock of an elderly man, sometimes identified with the prophet Jethro. He marries one of his daughters and serves him for 10 years. He then encounters the burning bush and hears a voice commanding him to go back to Pharaoh. And uh, the voice um, confers upon him the ability to work two miracles, turning the staff into the serpent and um, his hand turning to, to light. So he does this and he confounds the magicians at Pharaoh's court and they recognize his prophethood and Pharaoh has them crucified. Then Pharaoh declares himself to be divine, orders the construction of a high tower from which he can, he says, look out over the God of Moses. And God punishes him by granting further empowering miracles to Moses. Then we get a brief sketch of the Exodus and the drowning of Pharaoh and his hosts in the Red Sea. Moses spends 40 nights on Sinai, bringing back the tablets. Um, today you can visit Mount Sinai. I think one or two have actually done that amongst you. And at the top you'll find a little church and a little mosque happily sitting side by side. Um, but the Israelites, of course, have built the golden calf and they're punished by having to wander for 40 years in the wilderness. So all of this is more or less familiar from the biblical account. The Quran isn't really saying anything massively new here. But there are minor revealing differences. For instance, the infant Moses is rescued not by Pharaoh's daughter, but by Pharaoh's wife, whose name is Asiya. And in a famous hadith, the prophet praised Asiya as one of the four women, the four supreme saintly women who've been given perfection by God, Asiya. There's even a hadith in which the prophet says that a wife who is mistreated by her husband um, will be rewarded by God on the day of judgment um, with the same reward that God has stored up for Asiya, the wife of, of Pharaoh. Um, a few other distinctions. Um, in the encounter with this figure that seems to be the prophet Jethro, instead of meeting seven shepherdesses in the desert, as in the Bible account, Moses encounters only two. Instead of ten plagues, the Quran speaks of nine miracles, which include some of the, the plagues, the, the blood, the frogs, and so forth. Also new is the fact that the burning bush appears at night. And also new is the incident of the magicians actually converting to Moses' religion and dying for that belief. So that, in a nutshell, is the Quran's view of Moses, whom the prophet um, spoke of as one of the four great prophets of, of history. Another of these great prophets, celebrated by Muslims in particular as the archetype of the prophet Muhammad, even more than Moses, and mentioned in the Quran even as a Muslim, with a small m, if you like, i.e. one who had fully submitted to God, was the patriarch Abraham, or Ibrahim, as the Quran calls him. No fewer than 25 chapters of the Quran have descriptions of him. In fact, Moses is the only biblical prophet mentioned more frequently in, in the Quran. Um, there are one or two interesting passages in the Quran that illustrate its own specific view of Abraham that I'd like to uh, share with you. I don't know if there's another volunteer to read this time a passage from the Quran. We had John yesterday, perhaps. Yep, thank you. 
It's not, no, this is um, something new. Yeah. And we gave Abraham his right guidance before the time of Moses, and we did know him. When he said to his father and his people, What are these idols to which you are devoted in worship? They said, We found our fathers worshiping them. He said, Verily, you and your fathers are in plain error. They said, Have you brought us the truth, or are you jesting? He said, Nay, your Lord is the Lord of the heavens and the earth. He created them from nothing, and I testify to that truth. By God, I shall outwit your idols after you have gone away and turned your backs. Then he smashed the idols into pieces, all except the large one, so that they might turn to it. And they said, when they had returned, Who has done this to our gods? Surely it must be some mischief maker. They said, We have heard a youth talk of them. His name is Abraham. They said, Then bring him before the eyes of the people, so that they might bear witness. When Abraham was there, they said, Is it you who has done this to our gods, O Abraham? He said, Nay, this idol, the greatest among them, has done it. So ask them if they can speak. At once they turned to themselves confounded and said to each other, You are the real you, you are the real wrongdoers. Thank you. A story about Abraham that appears nowhere in the Bible. Um, a little anecdote about how he convinced his people when he was still very young that the idols to which they were devoted actually had no power. He smashed them up except for one, and when they came in the morning, horrified at this sight, he said, why did you ask the big one if you think that they're so powerful? And of course, they were confounded. Interesting account, perfectly in the Bible spirit. There's no reason why it shouldn't be in the Bible, but in fact, it appears only in the Quran. But really, the Quran's main interest in Abraham revolves around his foundation of the primordial house of divine worship, the Kaaba in Mecca. Some Muslim historians affirm that Adam himself worshipped in that place before being, uh, um, after being forgiven by God for having eaten of the forbidden fruit in paradise. There are a number of Muslim legends that affirm this. But Abraham was the first actually to build a temple on that spot. How on earth did Abraham fetch up in Arabia? Well, Mecca was, uh, was on the trade route from Palestine down to the spice cities of, um, of the Yemen. There was a good deal of traffic backwards and forwards, and it's not an unreasonable place for him to have visited, although obviously his visit to, to Mecca is not unambiguously explained in the Bible given the concerns of those who carried out the redaction of the Pentateuch, no particular reason why such an incident should have been included. So the Muslim historians recount how Abraham's bondsmaid, Hajar, was rejected by Sarah. This ties in with what I was saying about the Hajj yesterday. She sought refuge with the infant Ishmael in the wilderness. In Genesis 2, there seems to be an allusion to this. God sent an angel to Hajar saying, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. Behold, thou art with child, and shall bear a son, and shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has heard thy affliction. Um, and in Genesis 17, verses 20 to 21, Abraham prays for Ishmael in this way. O oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. And God said to him, As for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him, and I will make him a great nation and the Arabs and the Jews unanimously concur that um, the Arabs are the descendants of Ishmael, just as the Jews are the descendants of, of Isaac. Hajar and Ishmael are left in the valley of Mecca by Abraham on God's instructions. Ishmael, still a toddler, cries with thirst, and God hears him and causes the well of Zamzam to bubble up. And it is there to this day. And today the rites of the Hajj are in large measure deliberate recollections of this Abrahamic past. For instance, when you go to Mecca, you will see underneath a kind of crystal dome the very spot where Abraham is said to have stood while he directed the construction of, of the Kaaba. The sevenfold hastening between the little hillocks of Sotha and Marwa, which I mentioned yesterday, are a deliberate recollection of Hajar's desperate search for water for her son Ishmael. Um, the pilgrims drink from the well of Zamzam, and it's traditional to 
fill up uh, containers and bring home some of this holy water to give to friends and relations after carrying out the Hajj. And all of this is constructed to show Islam as the Ishmaelite aspect of Abraham's covenant with God. So in the Quran, Surah 2, verse 125 to 8, we read, And we made the house, the Kaaba, a place of gathering for all mankind and a sanctuary. Adopt the place where Abraham stood as a place of worship. And we commanded Abraham and Ishmael to purify our house for those who walk around it and those who meditate in it and those who bow down and prostrate. And when Abraham prayed, My Lord, make this city a city of peace and bestow fruits upon its people, such of them as believe in God and the last day. And when Abraham and Ishmael were raising the foundations of the house, they prayed, Our Lord, accept from us this act. You are indeed the all-hearing, the all-knowing. And this prayer, which is actually one of the most um, famous in, in the whole Quran, then goes on. This is called the prayer of Abraham. And it shows Abraham asking God to send the prophet Muhammad. O oh, our Lord, he says, make us submitters to you, Muslimain, and raise from among our offspring a community who will be submitters to you. Show us our ways of worship and relent towards us. You are indeed the forgiving, the merciful. Our Lord, and raise up from among them a messenger who shall recite your revelations to them and teach them the scripture and the wisdom and purify them. You are the all-powerful, the wise. Another explicitly Abrahamic sign of this covenant is, of course, the rite of circumcision. Without exception, the prophets have been circumcised. It's the sign of the unbroken, unviolent, unviolated <coughs> covenant with God. In Islam, as in Judaism, it's actually an obligation, although, whereas in Judaism it has to be done on the eighth day, in Islam it can be done um, any time during the, 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 the youth of, of, of the male child. Um, in places like Turkey, for instance, it's done at, almost at the age of adolescence, and in such cultures it can become a kind of initiation rite into to manhood, although it's generally preferred to do it when the, the child is, is, is a baby. Adult converts in several schools of Islamic law are excused. Um, I've spoken about some of the prophets that link the three Abrahamic faiths. So I've talked about David and Moses and Abraham in particular. Um, you can read for yourselves about others by the simple expedient of looking them up in the index of any translation of the Quran. Um, what I want to do now is move on and investigate the rather more complex question of the last of the biblical prophets, Jesus of Nazareth. As I mentioned, Judaism has rejected his claims to messiahhood. Islam has accepted them. However, Jesus is viewed very differently by Islam and by traditional Orthodox Christianity. In fact, a couple of years ago, in the Islam paper in my faculty in Cambridge, one of the questions for the students was, is Jesus a unifying figure for Christians and for Muslims? And um, I think probably the examiner bowled a googly on that one. Is that a familiar expression, to bowl a googly? Yeah. Right. It, it means to, to throw the ball, in a, throw a curve ball. Okay. So, sometimes, sometimes I need subtitles. Could you write that on Oh, really? You mean I've actually said something interesting this morning? Okay. <laughs> An extremely useful expression. Googly. There are literally hundreds. If you want a lecture on cricketing terminology, I'm your man. But, uh, there are hundreds of different ways the, the ball can be projected, and this is a, a, a type of curve ball. Anyway, to get back to, to the, the narrative, it wasn't a fair question, really, to put before these undergraduates, because it's one of the most difficult points. Is Jesus a unifying figure for... Christians and for Muslims, and I'm not sure I could answer that question. There is a lot of overlap, but there are also very fundamental points of difference. Um, the way I want to examine this question is by looking at aspects of the historic encounter between these two daughter faiths of Judaism. Um, now, this historic interaction between the followers of Muhammad and the followers of Jesus is probably the most fraught of all instances of interfaith encounter. 
and very often continues to be so. It's also the most interesting and uh, most well documented. Three centuries ago, uh, the great Dr. Johnson could say, civilization is twofold, there is Christianity and Mohammedanism, all the rest may be considered as barbarous. Nowadays, of course, we'd want to include Chinese, Indian, and other great civilizations in the rank of, of major cultures. But Johnson's comment is, in a sense, a summary of history as many Europeans have traditionally seen it. The Muslims are the only other people worth, worth talking to, worth dealing with. Um, thanks to its geography, medieval Christ Christendom had little experience with most world religions. As I said yesterday, if you went south or east from medieval Europe, you bumped into Muslims. Islam, however, was a lot better placed. Islam was at the center of the ancient world, and Muslim scholars very soon had interesting encounters and discussions with Buddhists, with Indian Hindus, with Zoroastrians, with Christians, with Jews. Um, so we find, for instance, um, one of the first great works of objective comparative religion is the work of the great Baghdad scholar Al-Biruni, who wrote in the 10th century, who went to India and actually taught himself Sanskrit and debated with the Hindu pandits and wrote a huge three-volume work called Tahqiq Malil Hind, an ascertaining of what is in India, um, in which he says that although superficially Hinduism might seem to be a form of idolatry, in reality, in its higher forms, it, it believes in the absolute unity of the divine and should be respected and dealt with on that, that basis. It's a very interesting book. I'm not sure there's an English translation, but there's one in French if you want to look at it. Very objective, very, very scholarly. Um, so I cite this as an example of Islam's really strategic um, advantage. It was easier for Muslims to write about other religions um, than it was for medieval Christians. Um, nonetheless, it's still the case that the other religion that most interested medieval Muslims was Christianity. Um, this was, I think, for three main reasons. Firstly, Christianity was Islam's great militant rival across the border in Byzantium. Uh, secondly, Christianity was far and away the largest minority religion in the core territories of the Muslim world. In fact, the Muslims were only a majority in the lands they ruled three or four centuries after the initial conquest. Before that time, the population had been mainly Christian. Uh, in Egypt, the Muslims over, only overtook the Christians sometime in the, the 13th or 14th century. Thirdly, Christianity figures very largely in the Quran. And it was this that prompted, um, amongst the Muslim theologians, further, often quite searching inquiries about Jesus of Nazareth, who was he, and about Christian belief. We find this in particular amongst the authors of the very voluminous Quranic commentaries. Whenever there's a reference to Jesus, the commentators um, illuminate it. So we can conclude that in the pre-modern period, at any rate, by far the most consistent and detailed dialogue or literary interaction between two religious cultures has been that which took place between Christianity and Islam. In some respects, that is still the case today, although it's, I think, true to remark that Christians nowadays take a more lively and often more intelligent interest in other religions than do modern Muslims. Whether they do this on some, uh, sometimes for genuinely ecumenical reasons or occasionally for missionary purposes. Nonetheless, uh, Christian writing on other religions is more interesting and better researched than is most modern Muslim writing. This is um, demonstrably the case. And perhaps one reason for this is that Muslims have an unfortunate tendency to view Christianity as something of a, a secondary or a spent force in today's world. And when they want to write polemical works or to dialogue with another civilization or with the West, they tend to target or interact with Western secular modernity rather than with Christianity, which I believe is, is a mistake, but this is what most Muslims tend to do now. Um, so let's launch this, this discussion of the interaction of the two faiths by taking the narrative back to the possibly unifying figure of, of Jesus. Um, there's a, a discrepancy for the, those who are interested in dialogue here because the Bible doesn't seem to mention Islam or the Prophet Muhammad, but the Quran refers to Christianity repeatedly. So there's always an asymmetry in dialogue. The Muslims have material to work with when they talk about Jesus. The Christians don't have scriptural material to work with when they talk about Muhammad. Um, so what does the Quran say about Christianity? 
Well, sometimes its references are favourable, sometimes they're quite reproachful. For instance, Surah 2, verse 62. Um, those who believe, i.e. the Muslims, and those who are Jews, and the Christians, and the Sabians, we don't need to know who those are for, for our purposes, whoever believes in God and the last day and acts uprightly, they shall have their reward from their Lord. So apparently a very pluralistic, open statement. Another verse reads, this is Surah 5, verse 82, you will find the closest in love to the believers to be those who say, we are Christians. That is because among them are priests and monks and because they are not proud. It's quite possible, and many of the Muslim commentators uh, support this, that this verse was revealed shortly after the first Muslims in Mecca had made that <coughs> migration to Christian Abyssinia, where, as no doubt Dr. Jackson has explained to you, they were received very warmly and given the, the protection of the, the Christian king, the Negus. So this verse may be a, a reflection of that. Another verse. We, i.e. God, gave Jesus the gospel, and in the hearts of his followers we set kindness and mercy. And monasticism, that they invented, we did not prescribe it for them, though they were only desiring to please God, but they did not observe it aright. This is Surah 57, verse 27. In this passage, we see a kind of ambiguous criticism of monasticism, um, which was an enormously important institution in, in the, the Middle East at the time the Quran was, was revealed. And the Prophet himself condemned monasticism rather more forcefully with the words, there is no monasticism in Islam. This is because ultimately Islam sees the world as not fallen, but as capable of reforming itself. Individual souls can reform themselves the world, human society structures can reform themselves. They are not so ultimately fall, fallen as to need direct divine intervention to do that. Hence, you don't need to retreat from the world and live in a monastery if you aspire to, to holiness. You can do it in the world. You can go through it rather than going around it. Uh, next verse is Surah 5, verse 14. And this is taken as a reference to the new covenant as preached by Paul. With those who say, we are Christians, we made a covenant, but they forgot a part of the admonition. So we stirred up discord and division among them until the day of resurrection. Um, this may be a reference to the great Christological disputes which had thrown the Christian world into sectarian tumult, um, something that the early Muslims were particularly aware of since the Middle East was so religiously divided at that time with Jacobites, Nestorians, Copts, Monophysites, Orthodox, um, Arians, etc., etc. Um, perhaps some Christians themselves would agree with the Quranic view that this was some kind of divine punishment for having misunderstood the nature of Jesus. That was how it was understood. However, the most substantial Quranic references to Christian themes are found in the Quran's narratives of the Annunciation and the Nativity. And here we have very extensive passages in the Quran. So, for instance, in Surah 3, verses 31 to 7, we read about the birth of Mary, who is dedicated to God, perhaps as some later Muslim commentators have speculated as a, one of the temple virgins in Jerusalem. The text goes on, her Lord accepted her graciously and made her grow in grace. Zechariah took charge of her. Whenever Zechariah entered the sanctuary to her, he found beside her a provision. He said, O oh Mary, how did you come by this? She replied, It is from God. God provides without reckoning for whomsoever he will. Like several of the Quranic references to the Virgin Mary, this includes non-biblical material. In fact, there's more about the Virgin Mary in the Quran than there is in the, the New Testament. Um, perhaps one should point out here the function of Mary in Muslim piety, particularly interesting, obviously, to those who have a, a Catholic commitment. Virgin Mary is revered in the Quran. She works miracles. Some perfectly respectable medieval Muslim theologians have numbered her amongst the prophets because God speaks to her, and that's the definition of, of what a prophet is, if God speaks to you directly. However, Mary, although her virginity is affirmed, is not regarded as Theotokos, the mother of God, because, of course, Jesus, in the Muslim view, is not God incarnate, but merely another um, divinely inspired prophet. So although the Blessed Virgin is very revered by Muslims and is seen as some kind of model 
Nonetheless, she doesn't have such an exalted place in the divine economy of salvation that you'll find her playing in, in Catholicism. And particularly in recent Catholicism, it was only in 1950 that the doctrine of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin was declared to be um, divinely inspired doctrine um, by, by the Vatican. So again, we have another figure who seems to be a point of contact and possible fruitful interaction between Muslims and Christians. But when we look a little bit further, we see that there are, in fact, key um, differences. Mary, as a... Mo Sorry, did you have a question? I think it's interesting that, I mean, she's still considered a virgin that have that in, in the Catholic um, Church. And I think it's interesting of all the prophets that are born, why is Jesus born? It's just, that way? it's just regarded as one of Mary's miracles with no further significance. Um, in the New Testament, obviously, it's regarded as um, the expression of the immaculate coming into the world of the Logos, who has to come into the world in a way that's unpolluted by fleshly sin or whatever. Islam can't see things in those terms because. Uh, sexuality has, as in Judaism, been regarded rather more positively in the Muslim tradition than in Christianity. So the accounts of the conception of the Prophet Muhammad, for instance, are quite explicitly sexual. There's no implication of an immaculate conception there. But it's been carried over from Christianity into the Muslim conception, but, but um, diminished, if you like, and reduced merely to the level of one of her miracles, um, rather than anything with great cosmological importance. Um, Another point that's perhaps interesting to bear in mind is Mary as role model. Um, she is another of these four women whom the prophet mentioned as perfected women, women without sin. Um, however, she has in practice not functioned as a model for Muslim women in the way that she has for Christian women, both Orthodox and Catholic, less so obviously for the, the Protestant churches. And the reason for this is precisely that her virginity is not, in the Muslim view of things, esteemed or esteemable in the, the, the Muslim context in the way that it can be in, in Christianity. Um, and the role model for Muslim women traditionally has been Fatima, the prophet's daughter, not the Virgin Mary. And there's an interesting commentary on this by some feminist writers, incidentally. There's a... Um, an American Catholic, and one of the Mary Knoll community of liberal Catholics, who's written a book on, on women's spirituality. And she points out that one of the problems that some modern women can have with, with Mary as a model is that it seems that her perfection is conditional upon her transcending of her body and her normal physical functions. And this carried over very much into early Christian ideas of female sanctity that the ideal woman was a nun, was a virgin, that she rejected motherhood and the normal functions of, of her gender. In Islam, interestingly, we find, although she is venerated as a kind of unique figure, she's not seen as a model so much as is Fatima. And Fatima's greatness is precisely the fact that she engendered the Prophet's descendants, the Ahl al-Bayt. She is the fertile <coughs> progenitrix of this effectively spiritual elite amongst the Muslims. And as a model for Muslim women, she affirms rather than questions the spiritual value of motherhood. Um, and more O'Neill's book is, I think, quite interesting in, in drawing this comparison. A um, little bit more about um, the, the Blessed Virgin. Um, in Surah 19, verses 16 to 34, we get the story of the Annunciation. One of the most beautiful passages in the Quran, particularly in Arabic, it has a lovely rhythm, it rhymes, it, it really is quite exquisite. Um, I have some of it here, I don't know if there's another volunteer for reading this one. Oops, thank you very much. Mentioned in the book Mary, when she withdrew from her people to an easterly place, she took in front of them a veil, then we went and sent her to our spirit, who appeared to her as a man without fault. She said, I seek refuge in the merciful God from you, if you fear God. He said, I am but the messenger of God to bestow upon you a pure son. She said, how may I have a son when no man has touched me and I was not unchaste? He said, thus shall it be, your Lord has said, 
it is easy for me. That we may make him a sign unto the people and a mercy from us. It is a thing decreed. Okay, so that's quite familiar to Christian readers. It's, it's very similar to the biblical account, although there are a few differences. Um, but then we get the story of the nativity, which is very different and more or less completely unfamiliar. You want to read the last bit? And the pains of childbirth drove her to the trunk of a palm tree. She cried, Would that I had died before this, and had been a thing forgetting, forgotten. Then he called her from beneath her. Grieve not, the Lord has set before you a stream. Shake towards you the trunk of the palm, and it will drop moist, ripe dates upon you. Thanks. Uh, the narrative continues to describe her bringing the child to her people, and they accuse her of unchastity. She demonstrates the supernatural nature of the happening by pointing to the infant Jesus who miraculously speaks from his cradle. And he says, Inni Abdullah, I am God's servant. He has given me the book and made me a prophet. He has made me blessed wherever I may be. Now he says this specifically to refute the, um, the Pauline take on, on Christology, which the Quran is concerned to, to counteract. He says, Inni Abdullah, I am God's servant. Not, I am God, I am the son of God. I am God's servant. And in Islam's view, that's the highest and most exalted rank to which anybody can aspire to be a true servant of God. He has given me the book, i.e. Jesus has been given a book. He, and the, the Quran affirms that the Injil, which is an Arabization of the word Evangelos, the, the, the good news, um, is one of the four um, written scriptures that um, we explicitly know have been given to human beings. Uh, whereas in the Christian perspective, of course, Jesus isn't given a book. The book is written about him by the four evangelists. وَجَعَلَنِي نَبِيًّا And he made me a prophet. Now Jesus is a, a prophet according to a certain Christian perspective, but of course he's more than that. So the first three things he says from the cradle are constructed so as to refute um, the, the mainstream Christian view of who Jesus of Nazareth was. Um, and then it goes on. This, by the way, is Quran Surah 19, verses 28 to, 40, uh, to 34. Now, this account, particularly where it touches on the nativity, is pretty unfamiliar. It's foreign to the four Gospels, foreign to the extra-canonical Gospels. In fact, although there's a lot of legendary material that appeared in the first few centuries after Jesus' birth, um, we can't find any parallels whatsoever in any of that literature. This is something new. Um, Joseph is written out of the story. So are Bethlehem and the manger. The image instead is the rather austere one of a solitary woman giving birth underneath a palm tree somewhere in the wilderness to the east of Jerusalem and then returning to face the scandal. The only recognizable feature really is the idea of the virginal conception. So the Quran gives us this fairly full, although fairly unfamiliar, account of Jesus' origin in the world constructed always for polemical purposes to emphasize his humanity. Um, the doctrine of immaculate conception which is retained does not logically conflict with the idea that he was a human being. However, the later career of Jesus is portrayed very thinly indeed. Um, the Quran's really not very interested in it. Um, we are told in Surah 3 verses 45 to 53 that Jesus had Hawariyun disciples. We learn in Surah 5, verse 110, that he was sent to the children of Israel, confirming the Torah with some amendments. Another important point, in the Muslim view, Jesus lived his life as a believing Jew. He works miracles, he brings the dead to life, that's in the Quran, he heals the blind and the lame, and he brings a clay bird to life. He holds um, a bird of clay in his hand, breathes on it, and brings it to life. That's not in the four Gospels, but interestingly, it does appear in the um, Gnostic Gospel of Thomas, which was one of the Gospels found at Nag Hammadi in Egypt about 50 years ago. So there is a, a precedent for that one. But most startlingly of all, and again all in the context of its um, critique of, of Pauline Christianity, the Quran appears to deny the crucifixion. Surah 4, verse 157 to 8 reads, They, the Jews, did not kill him. They did not crucify him, but it was made to seem so to them. Those who differ about him are in doubt concerning him. They have no knowledge about him, but follow mere opinion. Certainly they did not kill him, but God raised him to himself. Now this is frankly an obscure passage, and it's 
given rise to many divergent commentaries. The phrase, Walakin Shubbiha Lahom, but it was made to seem so to them. Um, just two or three words in Arabic is sometimes taken to mean that a likeness of Jesus was crucified in his stead. Um, some medieval exegetes, for instance, largely on the basis of speculation, say that God, in order to save his prophet, um, transfigured the face of Judas, who had betrayed him, to make him look like Jesus, and he was taken by the Roman soldiers and crucified in Jesus' stead. And there are a number of other theories that the Muslim commentators have, have, have advanced an explanation of this verse. But what is clear is that the Quran denies the crucifixion, particularly in the fashion that the evangelists um, record it. Now, it doesn't need to do so on its own theology. Jesus could have died on the cross, could even have been resurrected, but this would not necessarily have entailed any faith in Jesus as God, as a divine being, or in an atoning sacrifice for original sin. That narrative could have been preserved, could have been there in the Quranic narrative without interrogating the Quran's fundamental theological assumptions. It would just be another case of the temporary triumph of human evil with no larger theological implications. Yep. Is there any account in the Quran of Judas hanging himself? No. no. I've not encountered that. Have you seen that somewhere? I think Why I have. Uh -huh. He hung himself. In the Bible. I, yeah, I think, you know, there's. It's in the Bible, is it? Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. right. One other thing that I find interesting is the, is the denial of the crucifixion as you framed it sounds very much like what Christians call the heresy of docetism, mm -hmm. where Jesus only appeared yeah. to have had a human form. Mm -hmm. but they were coming at it from if he were truly God, he could not have taken on the flesh in, in full as a human being. They were doing it from the other extreme, because right, it was God that had been crucified. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I was asking the question, why is it that the Quran denies the crucifixion, if to include that narrative would not have questioned its basic assumptions? Well, it is probably the case that the Quran does this as a rhetorical device to deny the doctrine traditionally held by Pauline Christianity. That doctrine, namely the divinity of Jesus, is denounced by the Quran in Surah 4, verse 171. O people of the book, this means Jews and Christians, be not extreme in your religion and speak of God only the truth. The Messiah, son of Mary, is only the messenger of God and his word which he placed in Mary and a spirit from him. So believe in God and his messengers and do not say three. Cease, it is better for you. God is only one God. Far exalted is he above having a son. And on the basis of this verse, majoritarian Islam has traditionally attached the rather opprobrious label of shirk, of um, compromising the principle of the divine unity um, to Christianity. It's a grave accusation since precisely the same term is used in the Quran's polemic against the idolaters of, of Quraysh in Mecca. Um, the Quranic Jesus, of course, himself denies this, as, as I mentioned. He says, Inni Abdullah, I am the servant of God. So to sum up then, the Quran affirms Jesus, but as prophet and as Messiah, rather than as God. Key aspects of his gospel ministry, like his preaching of the imminence of the Basileos Torthion, the, the imperial rule of God or the kingdom of God, are absent entirely. The picture is fleshed out somewhat um, by hadith narratives and a lot of ascetic stories which filtered into the early Muslim community following contact with Christian anchorites or the conversion of Christians to, to Islam. But Islam's Jesus is always Jesus the man, the wandering ascetic prophet of Galilee who affirms the law and is sent only to Israel, sent only to the lost sheep of the children of Israel and does not believe himself to have a universal mission. So the Johannine and the Pauline Jesus has vanished without trace. Anyway, that's the Quranic understanding of the prophet Jesus. Um, what I want to do now is sketch something of the subsequent history of um, Muslim-Christian interaction. Um, the Muslims, armed with this new scripture, immediately and apparently miraculously 
conquered most of the Christian world within a few decades. Um, and they found themselves suddenly ruling not just one, but very many Christian denominations. So throughout the medieval period, when you read Muslim discourses on Christianity, you have to remember that they were encountering different Christian denominations. You have to know exactly what concepts of Jesus, for instance, they were, they were um, discussing. The great church of Byzantium, the official denomination of the, the Byzantine Empire, which had ruled most of these countries before the Muslims appeared on the scene, upheld the formula that had been agreed on in the early 5th century at the Council of Chalcedon, um, which was the formula of um, God having one substance but three hypostases. Um, I won't go into the, the, the details of, of that. It's a complex subject. However, but in much of the Near East, this great church was actually a minority creed. Most Christians didn't accept it. Most Egyptians and a lot of Syrians, um, these are the Copts and the Jacobites, respectively, um, followed Monophysite doctrine, which held that Christ's divine and human nature were completely fused. And this position was frequently subjected to official persecutions, as was also the Nestorian doctrine, which emphasized the, the human nature of Christ. And it was this adversarial situation amongst Near Eastern Christians that really opened the door to large-scale conversions to Islam. For years, abstract hair-splitting divisions over the procession of the Holy Ghost from the Father or the similarity of Christ's substance to, to that of the Father had exhausted Christian resources. And no doubt there were plenty of people who privately had grown disillusioned with, with the whole debate. And I think this is one reason why the companions of the Prophet, when they arrived on the scene, found Near Easterners, whether Arab or non-Arab, very sympathetic listeners to this new and, and simple conception of God. So there followed the extraordinary story of the, the mass apostasy of Near Eastern Christians to Islam. The only great Christian apostasy in history, in fact. More interestingly still, one that took place without duress. 300 years before in North Africa, at the time of um, Augustine, there had been no fewer than 700 bishops in North Africa. Three centuries after the Arab conquest, the last one flickers out and um, the Christian story in North Africa disappears. Um, the congregations of great churches, such as that of Gaza, for instance, embraced Islam en masse. There's a, a new book about Gaza which documents this in some detail. Gaza had been very resistant to Christianity and eventually um, the old paganism had to be um, rooted out by force and a cathedral built on the site of, of, of a temple. And it took three or four hundred years for Gaza really to become Christian. But within a few years of Islam arriving on the scene, the congregation of that church itself accepted Islam. It was converted into a mosque. Um, how on earth could this thing have happened? Well, I think it can be seen as a confirmation of the personal charisma of the conquerors. That's how I, how I, I view it. Um, there is a traditional European thesis which says that the Arabs coming from Arabia were these um, mad, fanatical, primitive tribesmen interested only in plunder, loot, and so forth. But such people, if they'd been like that, simply would not have disturbed the faith of deeply, sincerely Christian communities. Their, their barbarism would simply have, have driven the, the communities back on their own spiritual resources. Um, I suspect here that the traditional Muslim case is actually to be taken quite seriously. The companions must have had a charisma, a spiritual charisma, which the devout Eastern Christians immediately recognized. To suggest that half of Christendom just abandoned Christ for material gain, whatever that might have been, um, is surely incompatible with what we know of the great tenacity in many situations of the Christian faith. Now what's more interesting about this process of conversion is that actually the early Muslims who were presiding over it were not particularly well informed about Christian doctrine. There was no philosophical theology in, um, in Arabia. And there had been a Christian-Muslim dialogue which took place during the, the Prophet's ministry when the Bishop of Najran and his entourage visited Medina late in the Prophet's life. It's an interesting episode, by the way, um, because the Prophet actually allowed the bishop to celebrate mass in, in the mosque. Um, 
But despite this kind of early contact, we find Muslim theologians writing about Christianity for several hundred years really not understanding Christian doctrine particularly well. Um, for instance, there's somebody called Gordon Newby, who in 1989 produced a book called The Making of the Last Prophet. And he examines in depth the early sections of Ibn Ishaq's biography of the Prophet. Um, Ibn Ishaq assumed that, for instance, the prophets Jonah and Samson actually came after Jesus. That was the extent of the, the lack of knowledge about, um, uh, about Christianity and, and, and Judaism that many of the, the Muslim conquerors had. Uh, but this book was very widely accepted, and we can only conclude from this that um, the Muslim intelligentsia really didn't have a particularly detailed view of um, the biblical narrative. It also presumes that there wasn't too much dialogue going on, all these um, egregious errors would have been corrected. <laughs> Seems to be the case that the early conquerors didn't have that much of an interest then in the religion of their subjects. It's only in the early Abbasid period, that's say 150 years or so after the Prophet's death, that we find detailed dialogues first appearing. One of the best known of these that's been preserved is an encounter between the Abbasid Caliph al-Mahdi and the Nestorian um, Catholicos, the head of the Nestorian church, who was called Timothy. Um, I'll briefly sketch um, the, the outlines of this debate. The Caliph kicks off by remarking that Jesus can't be divine since he was born in time. Quoting John's Gospel, I go to my God and your God, and pointing out that if Jesus himself worshipped God, was he thereby worshipping himself? He goes on to complain that the process by which the four Gospels were compiled is um, poorly documented, so that clear references to a post-Christian prophet, uh, Muhammad, supposedly present in the original Gospel given to Jesus, um, are removed. The only re relevant prophecy he does speak of, and this is a recurrent feature of um, Islamic discussions, um, is Jesus' promise of the future presence of the paraclete, who is um, traditionally associated in Christianity with the Holy Spirit, but which Muslims identify with the Prophet Muhammad as the spirit of truth who will come. Um, the, the Caliph also cites the um, image of the rider on the camel who will come to deliver Israel. This is in Isaiah. And, but Timothy, in his riposte, says that this refers to the fall of Babylon to, to Cyrus. And then there's a very complex discussion which revolves around the Trinity, which the Caliph insists is a form of tritheism. Um, and it seems that the contest ended in stalemate. So this debate between uh, the Catholicos Timothy and the Caliph al-Mahdi is the first detailed account we have of an intelligent, informed encounter between Muslims and Christians. The early medieval period also witnessed the steady growth of a Muslim polemical literature about Christianity. And one of the most influential of these was a work attributed to the famous Al-Ghazali, who died in 1111, easy date to remember. And he wrote a book, or it's traditionally ascribed to him at any rate, which he called The Beautiful Refutation of the Divinity of Christ Using the Gospel Text. And here the author recognizes that it's pretty difficult persuading Christians of the um, Muslim doctrine on the basis of the Quran. And so he uses the gospel, translations of the gospel, in order to refute the idea that Jesus considered himself to be divine. Uh, another polemicist was someone called Ali ibn Rabban al-Tabari, who wrote an important book called The Book of Religion and Empire. He was a convert from Christianity, and he lists what he considers to be biblical prophecies about Muhammad. But more influential still was the Cordoban uh, theologian and jurist, Ibn Hazm. Uh, one of the greatest, albeit most controversial, of medieval Muslim thinkers, 10th, 11th century. Um, and Ibn Hazm has a book about Christian doctrine which is not just the usual pattern of the rehearsal of stock answers, stock debates, which is um, standard in the literature, but clearly reflects authentic experiences of dialogue that he had had with Christians. Um, so he has, just to take an example, Christians defending the Trinity with the assertion that since God is living and knowing, he has life and knowledge, and his life is the spirit and his knowledge is the son. So obviously there were some Christians around who saw it as an effective way of justifying the doctrine of, of uh, 
of the Trinity to identify these two uh, uh, components of the Trinity with two divine attributes. Muslims, of course, have a doctrine of, of divine attributes. Uh, attributes. Ibn Hazm will have none of this, and he retorts that uh, God has a lot of other attributes, such as vision and speech and power, for instance. These are also his. But this doesn't necessarily incline us to any belief that um, they are <coughs> hypostasized gods within God, or that we can pray to those things as recognizable entities. Um, another Spanish thinker was a certain Abdullah at Tarjuman. Book nowadays lamentably neglected. Um, He's interesting in that he wrote an autobiography, which medieval Muslims usually didn't. And he started off life as a Catalan priest. He was called Fray Anselmo Tormeda, um, quite a well-known theologian. It seems he was a, a Dominican. Um, and he, as he explains in his autobiography, became dissatisfied with Christian teaching, read clandestine Muslim literature, which in areas recently conquered from Muslims in Spain was not a terribly difficult thing to do. He traveled to Tunis where he announced his conversion. He wrote a book called The Gift of the Intelligent, which is still um, very widely circulated amongst Muslims. And people who are engaged in dialogue will often find Muslims citing from, from this book. In addition to these writers, we also find the Muslim uh, theologians, the philosophical theologians, um, discussing Christian theology, generally without polemic intent. They were merely interested in recording different, different philosophical systems. Uh, the best known of these was a man called Shahrastani. He died in 1153 who wrote a book called Kitab al-Milal wal-Nihal, book, oh, the book of religion and sects, in which he lists and describes, really quite objectively, the different religious views of his time. So there's a section on Buddhism, for instance, Hinduism, Judaism, and, and Christianity. And he does the conventional thing by blaming Paul for distorting the pristine teachers of Jesus. He says, he mixed them with the teachings of the philosophers and the wicked suggestions of his heart. And then he goes on to describe the main Christian denominations which were available to him, uh, the Orthodox, the Nestorians, Jacobites, and he provides an Arabic translation of the Nicene Creed. And Shahrastani's long account of Christianity is probably the most sophisticated and balanced account that medieval Muslims came up with. And it's fairly, uh, I think it's, it's a fairly objective one, and it was influential until the contemporary period. After his time, discussions became more or less repetitive. Um, and I think we can pass over later contributions in, in silence. Um, since it's 10.30, we might as well take a break here if you're agreeable. What I want to do um, in the second half of this is to look at the mirror image of this discussion, namely the traditional Christian understandings of Islam.